I think that he did the crime and he should do all of the time. He held me down, his body on top of mine. He put his nasty tongue into my ear. He actually asked me if I wanted him. You're my uncle, I remember replying, feeling so disgusted by his actions, so betrayed, so dirty, yet so helpless, as he still had me in the most vulnerable position. The only response he could muster up was, it slipped my mind. That was just a glimpse of the survivor leaving a mic drop speech about what her uncle had done and about why the parole board of Louisiana should deny her uncle that bit of freedom. Let's jump in and watch the entire parole hearing followed by an unpacking. 1967, classified as a first felony offender. <clears throat> Office, forcible rape. Sentencing date, March 7, 2001. Sentence to a total of 40 years. Pro date, August 1st, 2021. Good time, not eligible. Full term, May 10th, 2040. Is this information correct, sir? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Granato. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Nation. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. I'm Cheryl Renazzo. Your case has been assigned to me, so I'll start the interview process with you. So, Mr. Nation, you're how, you're currently 54? Yes, ma'am. How long have you been in jail? Since 2000. How many years is that? 22. 22 years of a 40-year sentence. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I look at your record, I see that um, you have another arrest for forcible rape in 1997. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. You were not convicted on that particular charge, but there, there was an arrest. I also noticed when I look at your record and the information provided by DCI that you enrolled in the sex offender class, but you didn't complete it. Are you currently enrolled in that class? Um, I, I, I really don't know at the moment because um, the class is because of the COVID um, issues. Right. So, but you didn't, it, according to what I see, you enrolled, you were enrolled in January of 2021, but you never completed phase one. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Why did it take you so long to enroll in that class? Well, at the facility that I was at before at Allen Correctional, they didn't um, offer it and did, and I was in it right a little bit before I left. Then I got transferred. In 2019 to DCI. Yes, ma'am. So you were there even a couple of years before you did it. All right. Um, so, but I do see uh, in the record that you have completed anger management, living in balance one and two, and you've participated in the AA program, and you have some Christian uh, 12 step certificates. You have 73 write ups, is that right? Yes, ma'am. And the last one was in 2020. Yes, ma'am. And the nature of that write-up is concerning for me, particularly since you did not complete the sex offender treatment. So um, I don't have any other particular questions of you, Mr. Nation. I'd like to hear if uh, Warden Bickham has any comments. Good morning, Mr. Nacho. Um, I Like you said, he... He hasn't completed that sex offender treatment class. I'd like to see him enrolled in that class. Um, and that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. I have no other questions, Mr. Kelsey. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Ms. Williams. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, I have a statement. I had to shorten it because I was told I only had three minutes. So, yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> so I'm going to read um, just a few key points that I highlighted. Um, if you bear with me, this is kind of hard. Um, <clears throat> he um, took advantage of the innocence, vulnerability, weakness, and helplessness of a child. He preyed on a child's inability to defend herself against the forcible will of a grown predator. When I talk about the impact that his adult decisions had on that little girl's life, even 20 years later, I think about the scarring. I think about the constant reminder that I was violated, disrespected, 
devalued and seen as nothing. Now he asked for parole again. The first time was when I had just returned from overseas and he turned my life upside down. Even from prison, even over a decade, over a decade later, he still had the power to disrupt my life. He still had the power to make me feel less than him, to make me feel disgusting, to make me feel like he was still in control, just like when he held me down on the sofa that day. When I enlisted in the US Navy and committed to serving five years, I honored that. Each time I re-enlisted thereafter, I had to serve that time, up until I decided it was time for me to be with my family, which was January, 2021. I didn't get to bow out. I didn't get to quit when I felt I had enough. Why should he get to do that? I think that he did the crime and he should do all of the time. He held me down, his body on top of mine. He put his nasty tongue into my ear. He actually asked me if I wanted him. You're my uncle, I remember replying, feeling so disgusted by his actions, so betrayed, so dirty, yet so helpless, as he still had me in the most vulnerable position. The only response he could muster up was, it slipped my mind. Well, I hope for the sake of the next little girl out there that he served the rest of his time so that he can play this in his head over and over again. It never I hope he never enjoys a peaceful night's sleep as I have it. As a child, I remember wanting to testify against him. I wanted everyone to know just how much and what kind of a monster he is. I wanted him to face me and to everyone else who was there to th that day to hold him accountable for his actions. They took away my voice that day, just as, he had, just as he had done. They allowed him to control the narrative once again. They allowed him to request a plea deal, and they granted it. Their reasoning, which I'm sure made perfect sense to them, was that it would be better for me to not have to testify because I was a child. I am no longer a child. I was a child that was powerless. If I had testified, I remember them saying that he was, there was a chance that he would have gotten his sentence without the possibility of parole. That's exactly what he deserved. But instead, he was allowed to take control of me, of my life for the long term. Now to drop it every few years, reopen these unhealed wounds and have his way with his selfish decisions he's making still until this very day by requesting parole for such an unforgivable act. He's been rehabilitated. I don't believe it. I'd rather not find out that I was right. This is who he is. Let me be clear. He deserves this time, every second of it, and nothing less. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear from Mr. Randy Meyer now. Good morning, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA Jefferson Parish. We are very strongly opposed to Mr. Carter's request. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Nathan's request. Um, 73 disciplinary reports, the, uh, the, the 2020 sex offender disciplinary report is very concerning. The fact that he hasn't completed uh, sex offender treatment is very concerning. Um, the, uh, the, the institutional report indi indicates he has a fair institutional record. We strongly oppose and we think he should be denied. All right, thank you. Mr. Nation, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? Yes. Oh. Um, Go ahead. I think that during this time, I think I have been rehabilitated to the best of my ability. I know I haven't completed the class yet because the class is ended because of the COVID issue, but I'm willing to go back and, and to that class and try to finish it. I know the nature of the crime seems unforgivable, but as a person who has spent time and been through a lot of different classes and been through classes about sex and domestic violence and all other different issues, I think that I, as well as others, 
should have a chance to re-enter society and prove to ourselves and others that you can be rehabilitated and made a member, a productive member of society. I think that forgiveness is hard on certain issues that sometimes, but forgiveness should be instituted when it comes to certain things. We all are children of God, and I think that sometimes we should just get the chance to prove that we are a changed person. So, that's all I can say. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. So, uh, pal, prepare to vote, Ms. Renata. Yes, uh, Mr. Nation, your your statement was uh, well received. You, you did a good job. Uh, I want to say to Ms. Harris, thank you for the courage of coming once again and telling us your position, and thank you for your service uh, in the Navy. We, uh, I personally appreciate it. Mr. Nation, because you have uh, one thing that's lacking, I think, in the classes that I mentioned that you take, that you took, is victim awareness. I think you, you probably would benefit from taking that class. Um, but lacking the sex offender, completion of the sex offender treatment, uh, I can't vote for you today based on the opposition that's been expressed today. So my vote today is to deny you parole. I encourage you to enroll in the sex offender treatment. Also ask to be placed in a victim awareness class. I wish you well. Good luck, sir. Ms. Wise. Uh, Mr. Nation, uh, first of all, uh, Ms. Harris, thank you for coming. Thank you for standing up. You, you're a lot stronger than you realize. Uh, then I think you, you give yourself credit for. I appreciate hearing you today. Uh, my vote is the same to deny. Uh, Mr. Nation, I just encourage you to take advantage of the programs and the opportunities that they're, they're there for you. Best wishes to you, sir, for the reasons I've already stated on the record. All right, Jeff, two votes tonight. I'm also going to vote the deny parole for the same reasons. Three votes tonight. Today, your parole's been denied. Good luck. As a child, I wanted him to face me. They took away my voice just as he did. Those are the words of the survivor. At 10 years old, she wanted to face him. She wanted to tell the world. She wanted to take the stand and make sure that he would be locked up forever. This is the hearing that I'm going to put in my archive, um, a folder. And whenever we hear a DA or someone in another hearing state that we didn't want the girl to testify because we didn't want to traumatize them, we can bring her up as an example about how many times they simply say that as an excuse. When I say they, I mean the DA. I think we are led to believe that survivors, all of them, don't want to take the stand. And that's simply not true. We have seen enough of these hearings where the survivor gets up and says, I wanted to. And you can hear in her survivor's speech 20 years later, after they had the audacity to force her to shrink it to three minutes, three minutes. There aren't 10 people coming up to speak. There's no rush. This whole hearing took 10 minutes. You could have given her six. No, three minutes, and she decides to include the fact that they silenced her, that they took away her voice the same way that he did, the same way that her uncle did. Let's just remember that. The DA is, the, the, you know, it's just, it's just a machine. It's just a machine. They get cases in. They got to get them out. And they make 
priorities where it's due. Now, it happens to be a 40-year sentence for this type of crime. It's it's definitely on the high end. We, I mean, we've seen people do the same and get just a few years. But the idea that now she has to be re-traumatized. I think she said this was her second parole here in which she, he wasn't supposed to be parole eligible until 2021. But... This was 2022, and if I guess he gets a parole hearing every year now? I believe Louisiana passed legislation to make it five-year wait for when it's offenders of this type of crime. So maybe we won't see, have to see him again for quite some time. What a speech. What a speech. Thankfully, we had Randy show up so easily. They don't. And she's imagined just being there alone and feeling alone, having to go through the anxiety of not knowing what the parole board is going to decide. Remember, she was 10 years old when her own uncle decided to alter her life forever. Something very unique about this offender was all the write-ups that he has. Usually they have none. The idea that he had, what, 60-something? That's, uh, that is very unique. Um, it's a very different level. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know enough about the how these offenders classify, but almost, almost always, I would say probably close to the 99 plus percent, close to the 100% ratio, the, those who offend against children um, have this weird lizard humanoid ability to have zero write-ups. Um, so he's obviously on a whole entire different side of the spectrum, which I don't know how you want to classify it as worse or not worse. I think those able to have zero write-ups are dangerous in their own unique way. And uh, because they're very good at being manipulative, at hiding their deeds. And those who have many write-ups might be less dangerous because they're not able to and they would probably stick out. That's my assumption. Um, but the idea that his full term date is 40 years and that he will get out, I suppose, in another 16 years and he is uh 56 so that will still be plenty of time to wreak uh, havoc and carnage upon the world uh you know depending on how uh what his life expectancy is so there should be some type of you know if <laughs> Who knows how it could have changed? You know, she. I guess we could say good for her as a survivor. You could see that she's on the face of it has done, you know, she still, she went to the Navy. She's taking control. She has the stance. She, she's doing, you know, an incredible uh, job. And I think we call be so proud of her. Um, but it seems that she that really what sticks out is that that, that a bit idea that she was silenced uh, by the system. And I wonder if it would have been what could have been different if they had allowed her to get up on the stand and regain that power 20 years ago. Something that the DA should should take into account, but I can't imagine that many of them do. That's just my opinion. But we'll see more of her. I'm going to bring her back up for different hearings, um, mixing them in with others. But with that, I'll let you go. 59, classified as a second felony offender. Offenses, forcible rape, count two. Habitual offender, aggravated crime against nature, count four. Sentencing dates, November 6, 2002. Sentenced to a total of 37 years. Parole date, August 1st, 2021. Good time, not eligible, full term, May 26, 2037. Is this information correct, sir? 
Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Kelsey. How old are you, Mr. Carter? I'm 62. How long have you been incarcerated? 21 years. 37 year sentence, correct? Yes, sir. Do you have a GED or high school diploma? Yes, sir. I received it here. Which one? GED, GED. okay. GED. And it's been a little while since you had a disciplinary write up, right? How long has it been? Uh, 10 years, I believe. Okay. What do you currently do there at the facility? I do uh, most of the uh, construction and uh, carpentry work for the compound. And uh, tell me what kind of classes have you taken? I've taken the pre-release and I'm uh, in the uh, sex offender class. Uh, which phase? Uh, I just finished phase one. And uh, you've been in jail for 21 years. Why did it take so long to get in the sex offender treatment? I was in it a couple of times before, but my work, the work that I do here, I, it interrupted in and, and I dropped out on it. Uh, it. It's all my fault that I didn't finish it. I should have finished it. But now that I've given, been given this chance, I wasn't thinking about leaving right away. I, I thought I was going to be here until I was 78 years old. And once I got this chance, I went right back and, and, and took these classes. Wouldn't you think you would have needed that uh, regardless if you were going to be getting out or not to help yourself? To, I mean, isn't that all the whole purpose of it? To... Yes. Yes, sir. I sure do. I still think I need it when I get out because uh, just to keep my mind straight. And, and is, again, these terrible crimes, was this, uh, were you on drugs or alcohol at the time? No, sir. So what, what caused that then? It was just the heat of the night. When I, when I came in that night, it was just something that happened. I let my desire think for me instead of my brains. And I'm, if I could go back and do it again, it would have never happened in the first place. It is, that's not Frank Carter. That was the old Frank Carter. That's not the Frank Carter now. Frank Carter's rehabilitated himself in his work. I've, I've, I work every day almost by myself. I'm always thinking about, man, what did I do? What did I do? You know, uh, the remorse I have for this, Is it, if I could tell the victim or, or Nicole how I feel and how wrong I did her, I would. I've, I've hurt not only her and her family, I hurt my family, my sisters, my daughters, my grandkids. I've taken all those years away from them. And, and I, I can't replace that. But if given the chance, I would like to get out there and help them in the way that a, the father and grandfather is supposed to do. And I, I, I'd like to, Nicole to understand that it's, it's something that should have never happened. I regret it ever since the day it happened. I regretted it the whole time I've been locked up. It's just, it's always on my mind, and I know it's something that'll never ever happen again. Because I'm gonna, if y'all give me this chance, I'm gonna be out, and I will stay in classes when I'm out. I'll work all day long and go to class at night if I have to. It's something that I need to do to keep my peace of mind. Okay. Have you taken any type of victim awareness? Uh, no, sir, I haven't. Okay. Warden, you have any input for us? Uh, yes, sir. good morning, Mr. Kelsey. Uh, Frank, does he, he said it right. He does a lot of work around here on the compound for maintenance and stuff. Helps us out with our maintenance and things like that. Stays out of trouble. 
So he does a good job as an offender inside the facility. I, you know, can't speak to what he did before or what he will do afterwards, but inside the facility he does fine. I would like to wish he would have taken some programming and sex offender treatment stuff, but, he, but, uh, but he does a decent job inside the facility. That's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, we'll hear from uh, Miss Natasha. Good morning. Oh. Uh, basically, I'm just here. Um, if he's able to get out, he will have. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. Where he will have a lot of support. Um, he has three daughters. Um, unfortunately, three of them couldn't be here because um, of work. Um, they short staff, but they also um here for support. Um, he doesn't know his grandkids, but they keep in touch over the phone. Um, some of them he's never met, but they also ready for to get out, build a relationship. Um, his sister is his nephew. He just has so much support and we are all ready for him just to be out and come home. All right, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Natasha. Now we're here for Miss Raven. Good morning. Good morning. So, um, <clears throat> just basically, um, what my mom did say. Uh, a lot of us, we've only met him one time. We we're only able to meet him one time. Before you guys changed the rules about visiting and age limits, but I would give anything to be able to establish that relationship with him because hearing him over the phone is just not enough for some of us and and it's not enough for me and I would like to be able to support him in any way whether it's housing or car situation we just want to support him so that we can establish that bond that none of us got to get from him and we all just want it and we all talk about being able to meet him one day and you know hopefully that day comes soon because we're all ready for it All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Raven. All right. Now we'll hear from Mr. Randy Meyer. Randy Meyer, assistant DA Jefferson Parish, and we have a very strong opposition to Mr. Carter's request. Looking at his past record in 1993, he was arrested for molestation of a juvenile and pled guilty to uh, felony contributing to the delinquency of juveniles. Um, just a few years later in 20, in 2000, he was arrested for the instance offense, convicted of forcible rape and aggravated crime against nature. The victim being a 14 year old girl that was the friend of his girlfriend's daughter. Um, he has not taken sex offender treatment, only, only the first phase. He has not completed that. He's not taken any victim awareness. The DOC progress report, I believe, shows he's only taken uh, pre release one and two. So his programming, in my opinion, is very, very poor. Um, for those reasons, we are strongly opposed to his request. All right, thank you. All right, we're here for Mr. Carter now. Would you like to make a statement on your behalf? Yes, sir. If, if given this chance, I will take any and every class that I need to take and that I want to take and complete I, and I would strongly, strongly want to emphasize how, how apologetic I want I am towards Nicole. I want her to understand that the pain and the sorrow that I've been living with has taken my soul. It has hurt me that bad. And I'd like to have a chance to be able to get my soul back. And with y'all's help, uh, it'd be greatly, greatly appreciated. And I appreciate y'all giving me this chance for this parole hearing. 
And I want to thank each and every one of you. Oh. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, now, panel will vote. I'll vote first. Uh, Mr. Franklin, Mr. Carter, you're, um, you know, it sounds like you're doing some good work in there. You, you obviously, you're very skilled. You, you, you're you doing a lot of work around the facility. You're doing a lot of good things. Um, you know, uh, I'm, you know, I'll be pretty consistent. I, I, I need you to see, uh, see you take the whole sex offender treatment, all phases before I would be ready to, 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 to release you. You're doing right. You've done well. Your, your disciplinary is, is, has been very good. I mean, you're, you're doing all the right things, <clears throat> but uh, I, I'm going to have to deny your parole until you complete the sex offender treatment. Uh, you need to complete that. I'd like to see you take victim awareness, awareness. And again, I know you're a good worker. I'd like to see you take more, more classes, you know, more courses and classes that will self-help and improve you, but uh, specifically the victim awareness and complete the sex offender treatment. So uh, because of the, uh, opposition expressed here today and because you need classes i'm going to vote to deny you for all um mr carter i do agree i think it's very important i understand why you didn't uh finish the sex offender treatment program based on your sentence and your job and all that but to us that's critical prior to release so uh my vote today is to deny i encourage you to enroll in and complete the sex offender treatment the victim awareness program you'll have the opportunity to reapply once you've completed those classes good luck to you sir thank you miss wise uh mr carter you are a blessed man to have your daughters uh, uh that kind of support so it's important to us that when you get out you're able to stay out in, you know, and, and just really be able to do well. So my vote is to deny as well for the reasons I already been stated on the record. Best wishes to you, sir. All right, three votes to deny. Today your parole's been denied. Good luck to you. What a complete cockroach. It's just, it, it's, we're, we're gonna go over the facts. Thank you, Richard, for providing it with this court document, but it makes me sick. His final speech, he, you unpack what he says. He says, the pain and sorrow took away my soul. I want my soul back. That's what he says in his final statement. And if he can't see the irony in even using those words to describe what happened to him, his soul, I mean, those would be the those are the words that we hear victims, survivors say when they describe the outcome of what happened. They say things like they've lost their soul, they lost their control, they lost their their youth, they lost that skip in their step. And he has the audacity to say that. It's just nuts. It's just it opens the window into into his emptiness there. I doubt there's a soul. And then you know, I only get more infuriated to find out that he had a conviction, as Randy Meyer pointed out. Thank you, Randy, for being there. In uh in 1997, molestation of a juvenile. Keep in mind his next offense when he came home and just lust took over he couldn't help himself when he threw himself on his daughter's friend that happened in 2002 so i don't know we don't know how, if he served time in night for his 1997 offense but if he did as soon as he got out he did it again and you think this man should ever be free are you kidding me man it's a roach He was found guilty by a jury too. The judge sentenced him to two different sentenced him for 15 years for the uh, for the sexual assault and 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 17 years for the um, for a total of 37 years. I don't know why they didn't throw even more of the book at him and give him just life. I mean, he went to trial. With, I don't know. I don't think those were the maximums. But um, the victim was born on April 28, 1986, and her mother moved to Grand Isle, Louisiana. ND became best friends with KB, a girl that she met at school. Defendant Franklin was KB's mother's boyfriend, who lived in the family's home. When KB's father, who was also resided at the family's home, was working out of the country, um, 
the defendant slept in KB's mother's room. When KB's father was in town, defendant slept in a small room on the first floor. At times, the victims went on outings with KB, her mother, and the defendant. ND testified that she believed the defendant was a nice person and she trusted him. I mean, this is more than, they're like really best friends. Um, like, you know, she's staying in the home. ND testified that in May 2000, she spent the night at KB's house. The two girls stayed up late watching a movie and talking until they went to sleep in the upper bunk of the bunk beds in KB's room. During the night, ND remembered waking up to the defendant rubbing her leg. He then said, let's go downstairs. We're just going to fool around. Even though ND told the defendant to leave her alone, he continued rubbing her leg, even put his finger into her. ND testified that she was frightened of the defendant and she told him to leave. The defendant picked her up and sat her down on the floor next to the bed. ND told him she was going to get back into bed. Defendant said, no, you're not. He then carried her downstairs to his room and placed her on his bed. ND testified that she tried to scream, but she was too frightened and nothing came out. ND stated that the defendant asked her if she wanted to smoke a joint. She refused, but the defendant lit up the joint and offered it to her. She took it and then gave it back to him. The defendant then pushed her shoulders back until she was lying on the bed and pinned both of her wrists behind her back with one hand. The defendant tried to kiss her lips, but she turned her head to prevent it. He pushed her t-shirt aside with his free hand and rubbed his body against hers. He also pushed her boxers down um, and touched her with his mouth and tongue. He then, he then, uh, he then penetrated her. She struggled to free herself and asked him to stop. The defendant stopped apologizing two or three times and let her go. He stopped, apologized two or three times and let her go. She ran upstairs crying and got back into bed with KB. Can you, I mean, like, it, 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 <laughs> you just can't make this stuff up. You, you think about her parents, you send your, your, your daughter to your best friend's house, you trust it, and then you find out that the father goes and pulls her out of bed. It's just, there's no place in human society for monsters like this. And the idea that even after a trial, a judge doesn't give him life is quite disturbing to me. I can go over the statutes maybe of what the maximums are, but I cannot believe that after a trial that, th that those were the maximums. Sentences. I just don't believe that. Um, Andy did not tell KB what happened that night because she was scared of the defendant. In the morning, Andy got up early, collected her things, and went home because she's scared and she wanted to forget what happened. She called KB later that day, and KB asked what was wrong. Andy told her that the defendant had sexually assaulted her. Andy reported the um, incident to the, to the Grand Isle Police two weeks later. KB testified that the defendant was her mother's boyfriend and that he stayed at her family's house for extended periods of time when her father's work called him out of town. She stated that Andy spent the night at her house on her May 12, 2000. They went to sleep in her bedroom about midnight or, 10, or 1 a.m. KB was awakened by the sound of the defendant talking to Andy. She heard the defendant tell Andy to go downstairs with him. KB testified that she did not... Uh, say or do anything at the time because she was scared, scared of her own father. Defendant took Andy out of the bedroom and Andy later returned crying. KB testified that Andy went home in the morning and acted like nothing was wrong. Andy telephoned her later that day, however, and KB, the defendant had, had done that to her. Um, after hearing the testimony and evidence, the jury unanimously found that the defendant was guilty of charge and aggravated crime against nature. In the assignment of error, the defendant contends that the evidence was insufficient to support conviction of forcible sexual assault and aggravated crime against nature. He points out that Andy was the state's only eyewitness and there was no physical evidence to corroborate her testimony. He calls uh, Andy's account implausible and unreliable in several respects. This is what his, his uh, appeal states. Then they go through 
why uh, all of the ideas of the appeal and um, and why the victim's testimony is uh, basically enough to convict him. Right here, the, te the victim's testimony is also sufficient to prove force of the element. It's, um, and remember, this was his second time in just like five years. And this is the second time, I guess, that he was caught, right? It's, and then you hear his daughters, you know, playing for him and, and all those things. And I guess it's, it's just, it's very hard to know um, the relationship between children and parents, right? But the, to think about the, the effect it had on them and, and their lives in school and being known as the daughters of the, that parent I'll put this link in the description. I'm just like scrolling through it. See if there's anything uh, notable to call out. He did this. Um, finally, the defendant argues that the descriptions given by Andy and KB were implausible. He points out that KB's parents were sleeping in the bedroom next to hers and that a babysitter was also sleeping there that night. It's like a full, he does this in a full house. It's just, I just want, what, what type, what is going on in this house that he asserts that even the smallest noise would have awakened someone. KB, who was in the room when the defendant allegedly carried off ND, was awakened. She testified that she did not attempt to assist ND because she was scared. ND testified that she was too scared to cry out for help. She opened her mouth and nothing would come out. The defendant committed the acts in his room, which was on the first floor of the house. The rest of the family who were asleep upstairs bedrooms would not necessarily have been able to hear noises in the defendant's room on the first floor. Um, so... Defendant now argues that the prosecution questions to KB regarding what she was scared of implied that the defendant had done something to KB to cause her to fear him. As such, the defendant asserts the question constitutes inadmissible other crime evidence. Defendant complains that the trial court erred in failing to grant proper remedy mistrial admonishment. It was interesting. is um, if you compare these two hearings, the one that we just did and it's, uh, let's see, they're, they're back to back hearings. One is four, um, 14 years old and they get there, one gets 40 years, one gets 37 years, but one takes a plea deal and the other goes to trial. And I, I don't understand how, how you go to trial and not get the book thrown at you. It just upsets me. It really does. So just for the record, I, I pulled up the leg, the legislation. So this is what he's convicted of. November 5th, he was tried by 12-person jury on forcible sexual assault and aggravated crime against nature. And they returned the, the, the verdict of guilty of both. So remember, he, he goes to trial. The survivor in this case takes the stand, right? Um, they go through all of that trauma. He calls her a liar and all that stuff. And the legislation, unless the legislation changed because this took place in 2000, the trial took place in 2001, but for forcible sexual assault, which is what he was found guilty of, it means that the judge could have um, sentenced him to Gosh, where is it now? Um, oh, hold on. It was right in front of me the whole time. So um, 
suspension sentence not not less than five years, no more than forty. So I love that they say not less than five. Like you can actually give a five year sentence, but not more than forty. Because doing that, doing that to someone, yeah, you shouldn't you shouldn't get fifty years for it. You should just get forty years for it. And so, so the judge could have given him a forty year sentence. But let's see, the judge gave uh, for that. The judge gave thirty seven years. So okay, so basically, nearly did give the maximum. Although he's eligible for parole after two, which, um, I don't know, without benefit of parole after two, for two years. Oh, no, yeah. He, so he still eligible, el was eligible for parole after just two years, which is madness, um, which really is madness. I mean, to do that to a child and then have to have them show up for a parole hearing every two years is, is this insane. And... So that was 37 years. That was it. So then the other charge, I guess it ran, it just ran concurrent because the other charge could have gotten him on. Uh, this is crime against nature. The maximum for crime against nature defined it in here. Would have been uh, not more than five years or but no whoever this is that's for a if you're under the age of 18 then it would be for not less um for not less than 15 years so it could have gotten another 15 year sentence for that one so that's what the judge did the judge did not throw the book at him the uh he was found guilty of both the judge gave 37 years instead of the maximum 40 and then he was sentenced to 15 years, which was the maximum for crime against nature. But look, um, it, it was to run concurrent. Trial judge ordered the sentence to be served concurrent. And why you would give him any benefit or any uh, leniency, this is his second time being convicted of such a crime. You just lock him up and throw away the key, frankly. It's, uh, you know, you could have given him the maximum. He went to trial. He called, he called the victim a liar, and then he lets these run concurrent. I don't understand that. And when the D, you know, the, the DAs, they hand out these like, oh, there plea deal here, plea deal there. And then when they go to trial, the judge says, ah, what's the big deal? You'll, you know, might as well go to trial, right? Anyways, thank you, Richard, for the information. And with that, I'll let you go. That was just a glimpse of the survivor leaving a mic drop speech about what her uncle had done and about why the parole board of Louisiana should deny her uncle that bit of freedom. Let's jump in and watch the entire parole hearing followed by an unpacking.